Hi, my name's Matthew May. I'm um, Director of Bakery for Kerry in Europe. Uh, today I'm joining Bakery Live 2023 to discuss sustainability and nutrition and its implications in bakery. So just briefly on the agenda, uh, we're going to kind of cover off discussion topics around what is sustainability and why is it a big topic. We're going to be covering consumer attitudes to sustainability within today's market dynamics and, and we're living in, in, in strange times at the moment. So it's in the context of where we are today. Uh, what does this sustainability mean to bakery? Uh, and also then what can be done to meet the manufacturer and consumer sustainability challenges uh, that we're facing at this moment in time? So let's start off with what is sustainability? Well, I'm sure everybody has their own view as to what sustainability is. But in reality, there's a definition that's been agreed uh, and calibrated amongst consumers um, as conserving and maintaining the environmental, social and economical balance of resources. So what do we see in the world today? Well, you know, climate extremes, rising costs, conflict, struggling economy. So the impetus to tackle the global climate crisis has accelerated since COVID-19. Um, and as you can see just from the news, we have uh, unprecedented reports of wildfires and flooding and so on and so forth around the globe, which is really starting to hammer home uh, the issues that are facing us with climate at the moment. But also as well with the expected global population to grow to 9.6 billion by 2050, the equivalent of three planets could be required to provide the natural resources that will be needed at that time. So governments across the world are setting strict targets to make urgent changes in this area. We also see that inflation is at its highest level in four decades. And obviously the war in Ukraine has added to an upward trend in food quality prices that began in the middle of 2020, actually, but it's been driven by a range of supply chain constraints and also surging demand for the raw materials required. And then, of course, the global uh, economic recovery has slowed. Uh, which has been impacted by the war and also broader inflationary pressures. So the consumer and industry uh, is under a lot of pressure at the moment uh, uh, in terms of in terms of the way the world is. And as a result of that, we see food prices rising, we see energy prices rising, and we also see fuel prices rising. What does that mean? Well, you know, the net result is that prices are going up in terms of groceries, um, and this is impacting on the pockets of the consumers. And at the same time, um, you know, there's 30% of all food that's produced in the world um, ending up as waste. Uh, and there's about $936 billion worth of food loss of waste costs to the global economy uh, every year. And if you put that in this context, um, it, with all the food waste that's there, we will be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases if food waste were a country. So just to put it into context in terms of, 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 uh, of, of the, the size of the issue that we face. So we're living really in a global paradox. Um, there's 1.3 billion tonnes of food wasted annually, and there's 693 million people on the planet that are actually malnourished. And the time is really to act now, uh, and, and there is hope. There is enough food to feed the planet if the world reversed the current trend of food loss of waste. We preserve enough food to feed 2 billion people, and that's actually three times the amount of undernourished people on the planet today. At Kerry, we live by a sustainability nutrition, and it's our ability to create nutritional solutions that help maintain good health while protecting people and the planet. And that's uh, the ethos that we live on a daily, on a daily basis. Regardless of how it gets defined, sustainability is top of mind for consumers around the globe, with 73% of consumers saying they would change their behaviour to reduce negative impacts on the planet. 78% of global consumers associate food waste with sustainability, and 44% of consumers globally are willing to pay extra for food and beverage products that help solve the food waste problem. Also, 81% say everybody needs to do their bit to make more sustainable choices. 
73% say they're willing to make changes to their lifestyles to be more uh, sustainable. And 72% say they'd like to buy more sustainably produced foods, but actually it's too expensive. So there's a, a bit of a dichotomy there. So all that said, um, you know, what is the role of the baking industry in this? And over the next few slides, we're going to cover off uh, a little bit more detail uh, about, about that, how, how that works. And in that, we'll be covering off food waste, nutritional optimization, process and cost optimization, clean label, uh, and also animal derived ingredients. So let's just concentrate a little bit on food waste at the moment. Approximately 50% of all food wasted globally is from bakery. So bakery has got a real problem. And if you think that 1.3 million tons of food is thrown away every year, uh, then in reality, you know, with bakery constituting 50% of that, it's, it's a big problem that the industry as a whole uh, has to face and deal with. And there are a number of ways that we can do that. But the first thing we need to really understand is what is actually uh, uh, pushing our consumers to throw food away or what is generating the food waste that we, we experience. Well, the first one is process loss. Um, and with this, we can look to reduce the process loss in our factories and in the supply chain, uh, whether that's with goods in or, or even uh, products out and into the retail chain through good manufacturing practice. Uh, and we could also use enzymes and other functional uh, ingredients to help with reducing process loss. When we then start to look at what's really um, uh, motivating consumers and retailers to throw food away, uh, we can really cut it down into microbial shelf life, textural shelf life, and flavour shelf life. So with microbial shelf life, this is food going mouldy or food being um, uh, heavily uh, uh, infested with, with bacteria. Uh, and again, uh, we can do things about this just by good manufacturing practice, um, but also by creating hurdle concepts in terms of controlling mold growth, uh, using uh, packaging systems, for example, uh, or topically applied preservation systems or indoor preservation systems. Consumers also throw food, throw food away and bake products away because the texture of that product changes. So cakes stale or bread stales, biscuits go soft, whatever that might be from a baked point of view. And again, when we come to have a look at what we can do in that area, we can be looking at, again, good manufacturing practice, making sure that we're, we're clean and we're consistent in what it is that we're doing. We can also use emulsifiers or enzymes or fibres or hydrocolloids to help with the uh, preservation of the texture over shelf life and also the packaging systems that come into play as well. And then finally, another thing that motivates our consumers to throw food away is the flavour over shelf life. And as we know, through shelf life, flavour can change. We can lose flavour or other flavours can come in, such as oxidation or rancidity. And again, good manufacturing practice goes a longer way to uh, overcome those issues. But then there are also flavour modulation systems that can be used to help um, enhance uh, flavour over shelf life or lipidic encapsulated flavours or encapsulated flavours that can uh, maybe mask off notes um, or, or, or prevent those off notes from, from starting in the first place. And again, making sure that we have the correct packaging systems in place uh, to deliver the shelf life requirements that we're looking for. So it's not just one thing, and this is why we have to take uh, the preservation of food um, in terms of a, a holistic approach uh, so that we can ultimately uh, either increase the shelf life of food, giving our consumers more time to eat the product um, uh, or, or, or to preserve the food uh, even better over the shelf life that we have already. When we look at nutritional optimization, what do we mean by nutritional optimization? Well, it's, it, when we look at the market, we've got HFSS regulation maybe coming in or, or maybe not coming in in the UK. 
And, and across Europe, we also see Nutri-Score. Um, and this is really driving um, manufacturers to reduce uh, sugars, reduce fats, uh, and make the products that they're selling into the market more healthy. And from a consumer point of view, there's a desire for a guilt-free eating that balances better nutrition with indulgence. Um, and uh, the consumer can be quite fickle. So uh, if you reduce the sugar or you reduce the fat in a cake, for example, um, if they see reduced sugar or reduced fat on the front of pack or the retail shelf, then their likelihood to buy is reduced. So they want the indulgence. They don't necessarily want fat and the sugar taken out when they're eating it, but they're saying that they want to reduce the fat and sugar in their diet. So, so again, there's a, a bit of a dichotomy that takes place there. But with bakery, it's never that easy. And when we look at what sugar brings, um, it isn't just sweetness to the baked product. So sugar also brings crumb colour or humectancy or volume or aeration to cakes and muffins. In biscuits, it gives us the browning and the processability of the dough, the texture, the final appearance, the spread, the height. And when we look at pastries, again, it's the texture, it's the flavour, it's the rheology of the dough during process. So removing sugar impacts on really key elements within A, the manufacturing capability uh, surrounding the manufacture of those products and how they run through the lines and how they process through the plants, but also how they eat and what their texture and what their sensory characteristics are when the consumer eats them. So when we're reducing sugar, it's important to understand what the functionality of that sugar is bringing outside of sweetness and then maintain as far as possible the total functionality of the sugar that that brings to a particular type of product. What does fat bring to baked goods? Again, cakes and muffins, emulsification, aeration, gluten formation, uh, or a reduction of gluten formation, shall we say. In biscuits, it's uh, again, shortening properties, uh, reduction of gluten formation, mouthfeel, flow, spread. Pastry is the same, laminated pastry is volume. And again, if we're removing fats, we're removing texture, we're removing taste, we're removing the sensorial characteristics of the baked products that people are accustomed to. So again, it's important to understand the total functionality of the fat or the sugar, uh, the fat in this case, um, and, uh, and maintain again, as far as possible, uh, the total functionality that it brings uh, to a particular product type. Okay. The other thing that's of importance really is process and cost optimization. Um, as we know, uh, there are a number of things happening at the moment in terms of our raw material costs. Um, uh, egg prices have, have, have shot up, um, uh, oil prices have gone up. Um, there's been quite a lot of volatility in terms of raw materials in the market. Um, so if we can optimize the cost and if we can also optimize the process, um, then that can also uh, bring benefits to, to, to the wider industry and to, to the planet. So 72% of our consumers say that they'd like to buy more sustainably produced food, but it's too expensive. And this was covered off a little bit earlier. And in reality, if you can actually improve your process uh, and give more optimization to the process, then inherently the the, the, the manufacturing costs should should drop, uh, therefore helping to make uh, the, the product more affordable to the consumer. Um, and they want to uh, bake goods whilst reducing energy, water and greenhouse gas emissions. So, so, so uh, we have a role to play in this area. An example of this really is maybe reduced processing time and, you know, there's a way that uh, the, the floor time with uh, 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 fermented crackers can be reduced, uh, therefore reducing the amount of uh, lie time that the, the dough requires before processing, um, uh, which then really enables us to increase the throughput of the plant um, within the same time frame. We get more products out of the oven. And also as well, because of the rheological effects that the systems have on uh, the doughs, then we can actually 
even reduce the baking time. And if we can reduce the baking time, then that's also an energy cost saving there that that can that can contribute to reducing uh, the use of the the fossil fuels that might be used to to, to power the ovens. Again, another example with wafers. Um, with the enzymes, you can use the enzyme to break down uh, the structure of the batter slightly so that you can reduce the water, add the enzyme, but still get the same viscosity. Um, so therefore the process doesn't change um, when you're depositing the batter onto the wafer plates. But if you reduce the water, if you think of a wafer, inherently it's 3% moisture and below. Um, so you have to drive a lot of water off to get to that moisture content. And if you can reduce the amount of water that's going there in the first place, then you don't need as much energy to drive that moisture off uh, to get to the moisture level that you're looking for. And it also had side benefits as well in terms of uh, enabling a more um, robust wafer that is less fragile and brittle, therefore less wastage uh, if uh, things are breaking through through, uh, through through transportation and logistics. Uh, or even through the process itself. So waste is reduced uh, in that way also. Again, just uh, a slide there to show uh, the, 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 the batter and, and uh, over time in terms of uh, uh, the reduced water content of 14 litres per 250 kilograms of batter, uh, reduced energy consumption, um, uh, shorter baking times and less waste than the batter control. Uh, and what does that mean in the year? Well, if we're looking at uh, uh, 853 uh, million kilowatt hours of energy saved, uh, 605 metric tons of CO2 saved, 130 cars taken off the road and 73 mobile phones charged. And actually, there's an annual operational saving as well, potentially for the bakery of 180,000 euros on energy cost. So again, this is tackling the issues around uh, sustainability with regards to energy um, and we're, we're you know we're, we're looking to reduce cost and that cost could potentially be then passed on to the consumer as well and help them achieve their sustainability desires as well we also say clean label as well and why would you say clean label well a lot of the clean label here you know it's kind of taking out e numbers or chemicals uh, and a lot of the chemicals may come from uh, the petrochemical industry or it might be uh, oils that are coming from the other side of the world or uh, in the manufacture of uh, emulsifiers and, and other types of ingredients used in the industry. Um, so if there's a, a move for clean label, then um, that's also helping to reduce some of the chemicals that might be used in, in the food industry. We're not saying at all that the chemicals are dangerous. We know that they have e-numbers um, and the e-numbers are safe or deemed safe to be used by the European Union. And in fact, if it doesn't have an e-number, then it can't be used because it's not proven to be safe. So, you know, it's not for one minute saying that um, e-numbers are, are bad. Um, it's just saying that sometimes where from a, a probably from less sustainable sources than, than, uh, than, than might be wanted. Again, there is the argument as well around the palm oils coming from uh, Malaysia. Um, we know within the industry uh, that the palm oil is actually a, a high yielding crop that delivers uh, a, a real benefit to, to the market. And, and it's, just a, it's a sustainable uh, crop as it is now. Um, but unfortunately, the consumer uh, relates uh, palm oil to deforestation. Um, and that did happen. We can't walk away from that. But there's less deforestation for palm at this point in time. Um, and they see orangutans attacking uh, JCBs and diggers. Um, and that's the, the point that sticks in their mind. So, again, you know, we can argue whether it's right or wrong. That that's their perception. But that is their perception. And, uh, and we just need to try and uh, compensate and deal for that. In terms of clean level claims, um, they are increasingly appearing on front of pack. Um, there's a couple of uh, examples there on the slide that you can see. Uh, three quarters of consumers surveyed indicated that they're willing to pay more for food with a cleaner label. 20% said that transparency had become more important for them in the past years. 
and 85 percent. Um, to me, the product information is of major importance. I want to know what the product contains. So again, there's a level of transparency here that the consumer is demanding when they're, they're purchasing off the shelf. So let's just have a look at an example here. Um, enzymes um, can be used to help with gluten relaxation. Um, typical relaxers in the market will be L-cysteine hydrochloride or sodium metabisulfite in the biscuit industry. Um, and SMS is also uh, an allergen as well. So, um, and uh, L-cysteine, yes, we know that there's uh, uh, vegetarian alternatives available now, but again, it sticks in people's minds you know, that they have come from duck feathers or human hair or whatever that might be. So whilst the consumer might be wrong, that's what the consumer believes. Um, and, and maybe sometimes it's just as easy to, to maybe remove those products from, from, from the back of the pack. And again, with the enzyme here, there's an opportunity to reduce those types of products from the back of pack um, and enable um, a cleaner label as a result. And then the last one really is animal derived ingredients. So animal related claims are on the rise in bakery, uh, particularly with the new launches. Uh, and we're seeing egg free uh, or we're seeing um, made with cage free eggs. Uh, or made with free range eggs. Um, and 56% of um, uh, those launches uh, globally uh, had an animal related claim within the cakes and pastry and sweets goods category. And it's appearing more and more on the front of back. So if you look at uh, egg, for example, egg prices have increased over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, a lot of chickens have been culled because of avian flu. And there is a move away from caged egg to free range egg within the European Union, which is also pushing prices up for the consumer and maybe preventing them from, from achieving their, their sustainability requirements. And we can reduce the egg by 30%. Um, and if we can do that, uh, for a total consumption of 6,000 tonnes of, of, of cake, for example, then that's 20 million eggs saved annually. It's 14% carbon emissions avoided, and it's 292 cars that are taken off the road. So again, by reducing some of these animal products as well, we're also uh, also helping uh, from from a sustainability point of view um, in that way as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Matthew, for taking the time to speak here at Bakery Live and definitely touching on some important points. Um, could you tell us why you wanted to talk about this topic today? I think it's a topic that's affecting everybody. So um, it's one planet and we need to look after it. Um, and at the end of the day, we all, hope we all have our part to play in that. Um, it's quite astonishing that bakery is 50% of all food waste. Um, that's not something to be proud of. <laughs> and uh, I think we need to highlight it and, and do something different and trying to reduce that um, and, and, and you know, play our part in, in reducing that food waste uh, from a global point of view. Absolutely. Um, in your presentation, you spoke about the various methods that um, manufacturers can use to reduce it. Why, why do you think food waste is so prevalent in spite of the methods that can be used to tackle it in the bakery industry? That's a good question, and I don't honestly have the answer to it. Um, again, it goes back to that point. We've got uh, a global issue from an industry point of view with a 50% of all food thrown away being a baked item. And it's incumbent on the industry, I would suggest, to, to try and find ways to reduce that and overcome that. We can't do it on our own. Um, I think uh, government has some 
way to play in this. I think the consumer has things to play in this as well. Maybe it's an education thing. Retailers have a, uh, a, a, a thing to play in here as well. Um, so, so collectively, it's an area that we, we have to we have to tackle. I don't have the answers yet, but the challenge to the industry is what are we going to do about it because it can't carry on the way it is. Absolutely. Um, just finally, you spoke about um, consumers' perceptions of sustainably baked products. Do you think there is this perception that it costs more? I think there is a perception that it costs more, and and particularly with the inflationary pressures that the consumers are under at the moment. I mean, uh, I, I can't ever remember food banks um, in the past, and we're in a situation now where there are food banks. Um, Money's tight, um, and you know the reinflation is, is real. Um, so yes, I do think that sustainability. The consumer is looking at the pocket and thinking this is too expensive, um, and maybe preventing them from going down the sustainability route. But uh, you now, as we've seen with some of the um, uh, examples that I've given, if we can reduce our energy input potentially, and we can get the same throughput, if we can reduce our raw material costs. Um, you know, by reducing egg as it's expensive at the moment or whatever it might be, then, you know, we're also helping our consumer then if we can pass that saving on to them in some way uh, to achieve those, you know, makes it easier for them to achieve what they want to achieve in their hearts as well. All, all working together to our bit. Which I Absolutely. Think is- all working together to our bit. It's everybody's collective responsibility to to deal with it and sort it. So it's it's a really nice message and one to end on. So thank you, Matthew, for taking the time to speak with me and providing some real food for thought. If anyone has any questions about a session, please reach out to him. Thank you very much.